All right, great. All right. Uh, hello and welcome to the Preserve Minneapolis Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Krishna Dorney. I'm a volunteer board member and tour guide with Preserve Minneapolis. Preserve Minneapolis promotes and celebrates Minneapolis's historic architectural and cultural resources through advocacy, education, and public engagement. Many of you know us from our summer walking tours. However, this year we are inaugurating a program of in-person and online lectures focusing on local preservation and history issues. These lectures will be recorded and archived to help make information about local history and preservation accessible to all in the future. Today's lecture will discuss the archeological activities surrounding the renovation of the upper post at Fort Snelling. Our presenters are Jeremy Nienau and Matt Pfluger. Jeremy Nienau is the owner of Nienau Cultural Consultants. He is a professional archeologist and historian with 30 years of experience and has spent much of the last five years working on projects related to the renovation at Fort Snelling. Matt Pfluger is owner of Fort Snelling and Photographs LLC. He is a photographer and historian. Matt has spent the last 15 years documenting and researching the Fort Snelling area. His study of archival maps and photographs has helped in the restoration of existing structures and identification of those no longer extant. Uh, before I turn you over to our presenters today, we would ask that you save your questions until the end of the lecture. We will open the chat function at that time and you can enter your questions there and then I will ask them of the presenters. Uh, so take it away, Jeremy and Matt. Great. Welcome everybody. I'm going to share my screen so people can see it. Camera. And, okay. Krishna, I'm, I'm going to let you let me know if you can see the screen and the presentation. Great. All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jeremy Nino. And uh, today, Matt and I are going to be talking a little bit about the archaeology at the upper post of Fort Snelling uh, and really sharing the integration between history and doing research and how that impacts and really informs the archaeological efforts that we've done over the last uh, series of years. Matt and I have been working together and collaborating since uh, 2018, first at the lower post and now at the upper post. And uh, we've, what I've, what I've learned as part of our experience and as our friendship has really grown together, working together, is that archaeology is an amazing tool to tell us things that are below the ground and give us insights and let us hold objects from the past and really make that connection. But often in places that have had a lot of uh, activity and development, deconstruction, reconstruction, and things that have happened at them, without the historic record, a lot of times we just don't uh, have a full and complete uh, story. So archaeology gives us one um, page of that story, and then history and Matt's work especially uh, really helps to complete the, the rest of the story. So our work in tangent um, provides lots of key insights and understandings to places like the Upper Post of Fort Snelling. So today throughout the, the lecture, I'll start off talking about archeological components and what we were doing. I'll turn over to Matt and he'll talk about the historic aspects of the work and how we did the research. And then uh, in the middle, we'll go over some construction monitoring things and activities that we did. And at the end of the lecture, we will actually give some examples of where uh, we found things in the archeological record. We didn't understand necessarily what they were and without the, the work that Matt had done, we still would not understand it. So Matt's work was pivotal in that. So just a, a little bit of a highlight for folks, a, a reminder, uh, if you didn't already know, that uh, Fort Snelling is a National Register Historic Place. It's part of a National Historic Landmark. It's probably one of the most well-known landmarks in Minnesota. From an archaeological perspective, it is designated as 21HE99. Um, Minnesota is the 21st state in this trinomial system. HE is for Hennepin County, and it was the 99th site recorded in the county. And currently, uh, Fort Snelling Leased Housing Associates is in the active process now over the past three years of developing the Upper Post Flats project using both state uh, uh, historic and federal historic rehabilitation tax credits. Um, the process and the project itself is really a, a mix of many different partnerships working together to make this project a reality. Without the support of 
individuals like the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, or on the federal level, the National Park Service, the county itself, Minnesota's SHPO office, and of course, all of the amazing hundreds of tradesmen and women who are working on the site currently doing all aspects of construction, this project wouldn't uh, work. The goal of the project itself at the end of the day is to rehabilitate all of the 26 historic standing structures that are currently present in the upper post and turn them into uh, just under 200 units of housing. Uh, much of that housing is affordable housing and it has a preference towards veterans and qualified applicants. So as I mentioned earlier today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the site itself and how Matt and I got involved uh, doing archaeology and research at it, um, the process and steps that we did before we actually got on site to do work, the construction monitoring process itself and give you a couple of nice pictures of what that looks like. And then at the end, we're going to talk about three different uh, instances or examples where we started with an archaeological discovery, an unanticipated discovery, and then through both archaeological and more important uh, historic work, we were able to learn uh, a lot more about what that uh, archaeology was. So I think most of us are pretty familiar with historic Fort Snelling, or also known as Lower Post. Uh, it's uh, started in construction in, in 1820. It was at the top of the old Northwest, a way to for the United States to come in and uh, take control of an area, monitor trade and relationships with Native Americans, and uh, keep out individuals from the North and other parts of, the, of, uh, the, of North America. Um, and it had a rich and varied life uh, up until 1946 when the fort was ultimately decommissioned. Later on, those uh, lands were given to Minnesota through the federal surplus property uh, program. And for the lower post, the Minnesota Historical Society is the entity that um, basically manages those lands that were given from the federal government to the state. Uh, it's one of the most uh, well-known and certainly one of the most excavated places in Minnesota. Excavations there began just a year before the, the centennial celebrations of our state. Um, back in uh, 1958, the statehood uh, centennial commission gave the Minnesota Historical Society $25,000 to do some excavations there. Uh, some of that was because there was pressure at this time from the Minnesota uh, Highway Department to create a plan for mixing through that area, highways five and 55. They had put out some plans in 1956. They were going to encircle, if you will, the round tower that was still present and one of the oldest buildings uh, standing in Minnesota. They were gonna encircle that with a highway project and uh, the Minnesota Historical Society and many other individuals thought we should think about doing some archeology. span um, Later, uh, just a couple of years later in 1957, John uh, Callender started doing work there. And within the nine months of that first excavation, he uncovered multiple buildings that were just immediately below the lawns and sidewalks of that property, which then started a archeological effort, which st is still ongoing to this day. So it's definitely the longest, largest excavated place in Minnesota. However, it's only one part, uh, if only one part of the overall fort. The lower post, Fort Snelling, is way down in the lower right corner of your screen uh, where the round tower is. And uh, what we're going to be looking at today, upper post, is this portion over here, this large portion, which now, as you'll see in a, in a couple later slides, uh, portions of this are under the highway, portions of this are also under the airport. But a lot of people don't realize that Fort Snelling was a very large property with hundreds of buildings on it over time. And we only have a small nowadays preserved a glimpse, a shadow of that overall fort. Uh, here's a topo map that to give you a little bit more of an orientation to the area. Again, at the middle top of your screen is where historic Fort Snelling is with the diamond, the historic diamond, the um, confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers coming together, the round tower, and then of course the giant cloverleaf stuff for highways five and 55 coming through. Here is upper post that we'll be talking about today. And then here is the airport down here. There's also of course Fort Snelling State Park, which is down here and managed by the DNR, just as the Minnesota Historical Society is the managing agency for the lower post. Uh, 
the DNR is the managing agency for the upper post. And uh, Matt put together uh, this slide showing basically an overlay of the upper post itself as it was uh, by maps. And you can see that in this corner, we've lost all these buildings to highway construction coming through. These are the 26 buildings that are still standing, the ones that are highlighted here. Other buildings on upper post were already demolished previously. Some of them ran into uh, highway work for 55 and five, and then all of these were lost to the airport. So um, although we have 26 standing structures and they're all being rehabilitated as part of this process to a greater or lesser extent, and the vast majority of them are being turned into to housing, we already lost a big portion of the upper post to previous development. So prior to this archeological and then later on rehabilitation effort getting underway, and that really started in 2018. And then by 2020, uh, the funding source has been put in place. And by 2021, we were engaging in the monitoring and construction effort. Prior to this time, in that, in that time period between the 1946 uh, decommission, uh, there was a, a brief period of life where the VA and others uh, were using the space for housing. But then in the preceding decades, and certainly into the early 2000s, this really was a forgotten place in Minnesota. Uh, you could see it from the airport, you could see it from the highway. That's one of the things that brought Matt's interest to this in, to begin with, is seeing it from the highway and wondering what those buildings were. Uh, but for the most part, they were all abandoned. People had done a lot of graffiti on them, they'd broken into them, um, they had vandalized them. The properties themselves had uh, been built during a different time when we used asbestos, when we used lead and other form, uh, things that are nowadays you know, hazardous that we don't uh, use in construction. All of those uh, were present on this landscape and we had to work around those as part of the early archeology span for the site. And then now as rehabilitation has happened, all the asbestos and other things had to be removed first. Dark part is sort of part of the removal of the interior process for the building restorations, uh, getting rid of the asbestos, getting rid of lead soils that are outside of buildings. A lot of large cleanup had to happen on this place, but really in a lot of ways, Minnesota had forgotten about upper post. They really knew about lower post and everybody would go there with their field trips and things and be very excited about it. But just across 55 uh, was an entire part of the post that uh, the upper post that people really didn't know about. So Matt and I got involved uh, with this project back in 2018. Um, we were contracted uh, with Dominium Partners and the Fort Snelling uh, lease um, partnership that got started and the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, there looked like this uh, time there was going to be a good funding source to actually have this rehabilitation occur. So beginning in 2018 and 2019, we uh, undertook uh, an archaeological, what we would call a survey of the property, a phase one survey, doing shovel testing across it to see what archaeologically was still present. Um, we did have to do work in a lead setting, so we had to wear uh, hazmat outfits sometimes when we were very close to buildings. And uh, we also uh, had to be concerned about people that were on site, there wasn't any fencing or anything like that around the property. So uh, there were some challenges to it. And uh, we had a large archeological team that was there. Once we completed our shovel testing efforts, we then opened excavation units to look at things that we had found. Uh, so we had a pretty good idea going in what was there archeologically, at least in a broad sense on the landscape. Um, however, uh, there was an entire component of this which was really necessary, and that was the historic component. Uh, Matt had started working with us on Lower Post uh, earlier that year, and in the fall of 2018, we really had the opportunity to, unlike Lower Post, where MHS had done quite a bit of research before our archaeological efforts, they, uh, there hadn't been a lot of research at all that was connected to the Upper Post, so Matt was able to step in and do an awful lot of historic research before we really got underway with our archaeology. And that aspect was critical to our overall project. So I'm an archaeologist with lots of background in archaeology, doing historic and prehistoric work. Matt is a specialist in Fort Snelling history and is pa highly passionate about it. And he and I quickly realized that we were going to become really good friends. And we started connecting together all of our interests and doing research together. So at this point, 
I'm going to be turning it over to Matt to talk for a little while about the avenues and directions that we did in historic research. And the background picture for this is our um, Nino Cultural Consultants, my company's um, um, library that we have here at our offices in St. Paul. We have a very large library that encompasses all the upper Midwest, but is highly focused on Minnesota archaeology and history. And if you are interested in the future and come and using our research library, we want people to use it. Uh, you just have to reach out and connect with me via my website, and uh, you can come in and do research in this space. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, so I got involved around 2008. Uh, started documenting, documenting the Upper Post photographically. Uh, once I had done a pretty thorough examination of the Upper Post uh, photographically, I decided I wanted to learn more about what I had just captured uh, in the camera. So I started at the Minnesota Historical Society, and there were a number of photos, uh, and there were also uh, some ledgers that were used uh, by the quartermaster department to document the the building, uh, the buildings, uh, and their maintenance. Um, next slide. So, uh, starting in 1905, the U.S. Army quartermaster department started uh, these series of ledgers, uh, which uh, would sort of manage all of the maintenance that were done on the buildings, uh, describe the layout of the buildings. Uh, it would give you a name of a building, a building number, uh, what it was used for, how many people would use it, the cost that it uh, took to construct the building, when it was constructed, uh, the materials that were used for the walls, the foundations, the roofs, the floors, square footage uh and then you know each year there was a tabulation of uh maintenance costs for the building uh there were even in the homes sort of a a list made of the types of furniture uh, that were put in the homes uh in this first slide here uh we see this is the first home on officers row uh, it's in 1880 uh, construction. It was originally a captain's quarters. There were five of these at one point. Four of them were lost to airport construction. Initially, officers row uh, in the very middle, there was a commanding general's quarters uh, where Alfred Terry lived. Uh, he was the head of the U.S. Army Department of Dakota, uh, and his staff all had homes on either side of this large mansion. Uh, the captain's quarters, which we see here, was one of the smaller homes. There were also field officers' quarters, which were quite a bit larger. Uh, next slide. So some of the things that, you know, we can find in these ledgers are, you know, the buildings that are still there, which are you know, interesting to us uh, as we're working on renovating them, uh, but also the buildings that are no longer there. So when we uh, are out digging or you know there's utility work going on and a backhoe uncovers or scrapes up against something we have to uh, stop the work at that point and figure out what have we just come across so uh, these ledgers in conjunction with some maps that we'll see later help us identify exactly what we found in the ground uh, this slide uh, is the former uh, Post Theater, originally called the War Department Theater. Uh, it was built in 1931. It replaced a, a previous theater, which uh, was built in a converted chapel. Um, the 1889 chapel was at, at the very end of its life, converted into a theater. It was very popular with the troops, so this newer uh, brick theater was built in its place to be a more permanent uh, uh, you know, construction for that type of entertainment on the post. Uh, next slide. So here we have uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we have the 1889 Post Chapel. Uh, you know, it was the first, well, it was actually the second chapel at the upper post. Uh, 
at the lower post, there had been some buildings that were repurposed for use as a chapel. But when the uh, army extended its uh, land uh, or, you know, the buildings, they were finally able to devote an entire building to worship. So uh, this is the second post chapel. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, we see that uh, when the new and current Fort Snelling Chapel, which you can still visit today, uh, was built in the late 1920s, they had this building and they converted it. They put some new siding on it uh, and they turned it into the first uh, post movie theater. So uh, the troops could go into this, you know, it was not in great shape. The floors were, you know, kind of slanted and it wasn't heated that well, but it was the initial place for the guys to go see movies. Um, in the lower left, uh, we have the post schoolhouse, uh, built also in 1889. Um, previous to that, right when the upper post got rolling, uh, there was a building that had a chapel, a schoolhouse, and administration all together. That had to come down to make room for the barracks that came in in 1889, which we'll see a little bit of later. Uh, so they split the functionality of that building between a chapel and a schoolhouse, and the office portion eventually moved into the headquarters building with the clock tower in it, which is still there today. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, another thing we can learn from the ledgers is as these buildings uh, were improved upon over the years, they often changed shape. So on the left, we see the original dead house or morgue uh, right behind the hospital building. Uh, you know, it's where uh, remains were processed, uh, and eventually, over the years, uh, it was expanded. Uh, as we see on the right-hand side, they basically just uh, knocked off a wall and added a whole new section to it. That building eventually expanded even more and became non-commissioned officers' quarters in the late 30s. So, you know, imagine growing up in the building that used to be the morgue. Uh, I'm sure that was exciting for the kids. Uh, next slide. And the hospital, Building 55, which is also still there, uh, currently a lot of work going on there to get it into shape, has been a bit of a conundrum for the structural engineers and architects uh, because the building was built on multiple times, uh, you know, maybe a dozen times or more little sections were added on. Uh, in the late 1890s, 1898, it went into use. It was replacing a previous uh, wood frame hospital uh, that stood about where the footings for the Mendota Bridge are right now, which was in horrible repair. No, you know, minimal plumbing, we'll say. Uh, just not a great place. So they built a more permanent structure, got funding from Congress. Uh, in the upper left, we see the original footprint of that building sort of an administration center and then a hospital wing on the right. Uh, eventually a section was built off the back, which we see in the right there. Uh, and in the lower left, we see a new wing uh, heading off to the side. Eventually that was added to, an elevator was placed in it and uh, the, the hospital kept on growing. Um, you know, all different eras of construction, different materials, uh, some better, some worse. There was uh, some wood construction off the back of it, which completely rotted out eventually. Uh, next slide. So those quartermaster ledgers in conjunction with historic maps uh, give us an idea of the, uh, the layout of the fort and how it changed over the years. Um, bits were added, bits were taken away. Buildings came and went, uh, and often you could find corresponding historic photographs or entries in the quartermaster ledgers to kind of fill in the pieces. Uh, this first map is from 1885 uh, from the office of Lieutenant John Biddle um, of the Department of Dakota headquarters. Uh, you know, it, initially the upper post was built specifically to house the administration for the Department of Dakota. The Department of Dakota was uh, the basically state of Minnesota, the Dakota Territory, what is now North and South Dakota, and the Montana Territory. And that entire eight area was overseen from Fort Snelling. Uh, before that, it had been housed in downtown St. Paul. 
uh, in a beautiful building, but in 1878, Congress decided that military headquarters needed to be housed on military bases. So everybody was forced to move out to Fort Snelling, whether they liked it or not. And it led to a big burst of construction. And, you know, the a lot of those buildings are what make up the upper post now. Next slide. So this is a, you know, there's different types of maps. Some just give us outlines, some are uh, part of construction documents. Uh, this is showing we have, you know, officers row uh, built around 1880 in the top. We've got our headquarters building. Uh, we've got some wood frame buildings down below that were for civilian employees. And now they're building the new barracks. So there were originally four barracks. There's three left. Uh, they built them in phases, two at a time. And this map, uh, which uh, was found out at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, uh, you know, shows we have the first two built. The footprints are laid in for the second. And it gave us a great idea of the water and sewer uh, in inputs. So as construction was going on to put in new utilities in the last few years, old utilities were found. And maps like this give us a great idea uh, when we find something in the ground, what it could potentially be. And we can decide that it is either important or not important. And, you know, identification is sort of the key. Um, and it's maps like this that give us that kind of insight. Next slide. This is an 1895 map of the same area. Uh, we see there have been more additions, you know, with the uh, barracks now fully built, uh, uh, there needed to be a chapel and a schoolhouse. So those were added behind the headquarters. Uh, we see a prison has now been built uh, just to the right of that. Uh, so any prisoners from the post uh, were housed there. Uh, we have a, a building for non-commissioned officers uh, behind that. Uh, we have an ice house to keep everybody, uh, you know, ice to keep the home's uh, refrigeration units cool in the summer. And we see a couple of buildings popping up behind the second barracks. Um, we see a bakery. We see a root house. And one big difference is in the row of officers' homes, uh, in the previous map, there were fewer homes. They realized that these yards were enormous. They had more officers. They were adding more troops. A full regiment was now stationed there. And they took uh, advantage of the empty space and built new homes in 1892 in between the original homes. Next slide. This is a 1903 map. Uh, you know, one of the insights we have here is that there's a color coding to it. So the uh, red buildings are of stone uh, or brick, and the brown buildings are made of wood. So we know when we're uh, getting into the ground and what type of materials we might find. We would expect to find brick with some more uh, wooden nails with uh, the different types of construction. Um, we have the new gymnasium uh, in the upper right hand corner that is a building that's still there that is the building that if uh, any of you are following closely uh, there was a fire incident during the construction last year uh, but you know preservationists and uh, the different companies involved really you know pulled out all the stops and have made sure that that building is on track to be restored and it will you know we'll get it back to the former beauty that it had a beautiful red brick building uh and again behind the second barracks we see this little l-shaped wooden building that we'll we'll touch back on later next slide so this is a 1920 map uh well i i should say circa 1920 a lot of these maps don't have dates but you kind of look at uh, what we know from the historic record to put a date to the map. And we know that uh, during the World War I period, there were a lot of temporary wooden structures built uh, directly after World, I, uh, World War I. Uh, Fort Snelling was designated as a general hospital, a recovery center for troops that were wounded in the war. So we see uh, 
uh, these little wooden hospital wards popping up around the hospital building. Uh, we also see a new addition over between the third and fourth barracks. Uh, we have an indoor firing range. So in the harsh winter, guys can still keep up their uh, marksmanship skills. And I let's see, next slide. So in addition to the maps and the uh, photographs and the ledgers, uh, we have to dig a little deeper. Only so much of this is available in Minnesota. So in uh, 2018, I started taking road trips uh, out to the National Archives facilities in Washington, D.C. and College Park, Maryland. I found a beautiful little row house uh, in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia, uh, which is conveniently half a block from a great taco joint, uh, which was a deciding factor for me in choosing it. Uh, so we get on the train, uh, head into Washington, D.C., and we go to the National Archives and, uh, you know, before you head into the, the archives, you need to have planning done ahead. You need to know what documents you're going to pull because your time is limited. So you do all that in advance. So you can get on the Metro, uh, we see on the left there, and head to uh, the National Archives 1. Or uh, equidistant from home base in Alexandria, Virginia, is Archives 2 at College Park, Maryland, over on the right. Uh, each floor there is devoted to a different type of record. Uh, there's a floor for textual, a floor for photographic, a floor for cartographic, and one I've not gotten into yet is moving pictures up on the top. Next slide. So when you're at the archives in DC, you have a little workstation. Uh, you have a little cart that you request your documents get pulled out on. These are quartermaster documents uh, from the late 1800s, uh, you know, mixed in there, there are letters uh, from Josiah Snelling and, you know, all sorts of every little thing you can imagine. And it's all a big jumble. You don't know what you're going to get next. And in the upper right, you see those are building plans. They have been folded up and tied up with little pieces of red string for, you know, 100 years or more. And you get to pull them out and there are great staff there able to help you. Uh, they help you examine the documents safely so you don't damage them. So you see there's a little pillow on the table uh, so you can rest the book and not uh, stress out the spine. Uh, next slide. Uh, when you get into some of these documents, we start to see records of the buildings that are still standing, how they were constructed, what the original uh, dimensions were. Uh, these two came from National Archives 2 at College Park. We have the headquarters building, uh, and you'll notice uh, it looks mostly like it does today with one big exception. There's no clock in it. The clock was added later. Uh, it was a couple years after it was built. The clock tower was added to the top. On the right, we see the plans for the captain's quarters that we saw the photo of in the quartermaster ledger. Uh, there, you know, are in addition to the view we see here, uh, there's breakouts of the walls, the floors, the floor plans, the, you know, the sizes of the rooms with the dimensions and the function of each room. Next slide. On the left, we have a field officer's quarters. Uh, this is, there are, well, it's like four or five of those left. Those were the big houses, uh, you know, for the upper level officers. So they were significantly larger than the captain's quarters. Um, and, you know, families lived in those buildings up into the 1970s with the Veterans Administration. I was, uh, you know, very fortunate to spend time with uh, some of the kids uh, that grew up there last year. The kids still have reunions, uh, you know, every year or two get together and uh, share stories. And, uh, you know, I was blessed to be welcomed into their little family and learn a lot more uh, firsthand stories about living in these buildings that are now, uh, you know, getting repaired and we'll have families in them once again. On the right, we have a basement plan for what was the prison. Uh, you know, we see where the boiler was located, where the furnace was located. And as these buildings were uh, worked on in the last few years and they started redoing the floors, they started finding mysterious things and it was records like this that helped us uh you know work with the architectural historians uh to identify what they were finding and you know determining whether or not it was of any significance and next slide <laughs> 
Uh, so the plans that we saw all crumbled up in the box earlier, that's an example on the left here. So that document had probably not been unfolded for a hundred years or more. Um, that is a privy for the soldiers barracks. So there was one behind each of these barracks. They're long gone, destroyed. But, you know, when we found little fragments of them, uh, we were able to determine, you know, what we were looking at, um, you know, how the matter was pumped out and all of that is laid out. Uh, and on the right, uh, we have a document uh, that was extremely important uh, in the history of Officers Row. Uh, we get to, we were able to determine who lived in each of these original houses uh, based on this document. Uh, and then once we knew what the position was, we could correlate with uh, St. Paul City guides that had lists of the military departments, and we could then build biographies behind the, the re original residents of each of these homes. And uh, I think back to Jeremy. All right. Thanks, Matt. So I'm going to briefly cover here um, because we, we want to make sure we leave a lot of time to talk about the some of the archaeological examples and give some time for questions. I'm just going to briefly talk about the goals of construction monitoring. As Matt alluded to, uh, when we started the construction monitoring process three years ago now, uh, we had in place a protocol document that had been agreed to by all the parties involved, the DNR, the construction efforts, the um, new lease uh, people for it for, from Dominium, and for the State Historic Preservation Office, basically saying, as monitoring happens, if archaeology is found, what is the protocol for doing that? So who gets called? When do they get called? What efforts we can undertake? What kind of licenses we need throughout the process? And really, the goal of construction monitoring uh, wasn't to stop or delay construction. Uh, it was really to understand and document things that we found. Um, and if during the process of that uh, monitoring work, if we found something that seemed to be of great importance, it was still relatively intact, and it had a lot of ar ar archaeology and artifacts associated with it, uh, then we would slow down, we would do archaeology on that and before construction proceeded. So a lot of times you would have a construction worker working in a machine, you'd have construction officials, including those from Weiss that are overlooking the entire project. So this is actually Joe Fort, the individual that's in charge of the entire operation. Here's one of my construction monitors actively watching the activity. Um, every single day, every time there is one of these people operating on site, we have monitors watching it. And we have a lot of other things outside of construction that happen, like lots of meetings. And when we were doing our efforts, we found very interesting, sometimes quite ephemeral uh, pieces of a landscape uh, from, from former curbing and little short walls and planters, things that we don't necessarily see in uh, other forms of documentation. And those are really exciting. There are several different types of monitoring activities. I'm just going to briefly go through these again for time. Uh, one of the first things we did when we got on site is they had to remove all of the old roads and sidewalks and things to put in wider ones, ones that were ADA conforming, um, new orientation to roads, make sure emergency vehicles could come through. So removals was the first big piece. And again, we always watched with monitors. Uh, then we moved into temporary uh, electricity and uh, temporary utilities and, and activities so that they could actually electrify buildings, heat them in the winter time while they were doing um, their reconstruction efforts. Uh, then we moved into a major phase, which was landscape changes. Every inch of the, the entire upper post has been touched in some way by construction. So when we're doing um, tree clearing, and uh, which we can only do during certain times of the year because of uh, species and things that could potentially be nesting in them temporarily or flying through. Um, but then when we were doing large scale land clearing, we would find the outlines of old garages, old forms of sidewalks, old benches and things that were only in a couple of pictures. It, landscape change was a really um, interesting part of our work. Uh, also, we had to renovate the outsides of the buildings. These are areas that had a lot of lead and lead uh, paint had dripped down over the years and had in, and been gotten into the land. And so they had to redo exterior landscape work. They had to put in new stairwells and pieces uh, for folks so they could actually, um, if they had a basement unit, they could get outside of that unit through an egress window. So they had to put those in. And of course, we monitored every single step along the way. Uh, 
Uh, however, the largest single type of sort of large scale excavation that's been done during uh, this construction effort has been for new utilities. Many of these utilities have to be buried quite deeply. So they're going 10 to 15 to 20 feet into the ground, opening up large swaths of the landscape. Now, some of these pictures just to give you the, the idea. Here's people way down here. I'm way above them standing on the original ground surface. They use sometimes they use big uh, boxes to protect them while they're down in trenches. Uh, but most of the time they're opening up large swath areas so that they can safely do their work. But that means we also have the, an opportunity to find lots of interesting things. So now we're going to talk about uh, three different examples of where monitoring found archaeological materials, what I found as an archaeologist, and then uh, calling Matt as part of that process and saying, Matt, look what we found. What is this stuff? Um, working with Matt and to figure out what these things were. So in each of these three cases, in other places on the fort, we might have an archaeological record that tells us what this thing is. We have lots of dates ranges from artifacts and other things, we would know exactly what we found. But in each of these three examples, we had scant archaeological evidence and we really needed the historic record to help us. So the first of these is a mysterious building um, that is located, so Matt was talking about the dead house or the morgue. This is up near the uh, northern part of the, of the post. And we were putting in a new garage and a new parking area. And uh, we found this poured cinder block pier with a little uh, negative space for a post to go inside of that. We thought at the time, oh, okay, that's interesting. Maybe it's maybe there was a clothesline out here. Maybe there's a, a, a light pole or something that was put in place. So we documented it. We kept moving forward with the project. And then we found another pier south of that pier. So now we had two piers. Um, as we continued to expand out the area, ultimately we found a series of 12 piers uh, that were clearly for elevating a building. We found a stretch of a single course of limestone um, that was about 10 feet long. And um, that was about it from a, a structural perspective. We had a few artifacts uh, that we'd found, a handful of, of nails and some ceramic, uh, some glass. Uh, we did find a um, Winslow Glass Company uh, fragment of a bottle uh, that was from 1916 to 1940. So, but, but a lot of that material, there's lots of archaeology that's out there from the entire time period of the fort. So that didn't really um, narrow it down for us. So we really didn't know what this surprise building was. Uh, that's when Matt got involved. So at the end here, here's just a map that shows these are the first two piers that we found. This is the new garage that was put in place. Here is the morgue or the dead house building that's there. Now there's a parking area for this garage. And there were 12 of these piers that were found. We also found some internal um, previous utilities for water and sanitary. And there was a, a section of wall that was also exposed. And now I'll turn it over to Matt to talk about what his research found about this building. So I looked at maps going back to the 1870s and 80s. Uh, there was very little in the early years. And then finally, uh, on just a couple of maps uh, from 1937, 1938, something shows up in that footprint. Um, it is only found on a, uh, some maps that are labeled as having been adjusted, uh, quartermaster maps that have been adjusted by the WPA. So uh, we see that this odd shaped structure that appears on both of these maps uh, is not labeled. There's no number corresponding to it like we see on all the other buildings, uh, indicating that this is probably not something maintained by the army. Uh, this is, you know, something built and used by somebody else. Uh, and because it corresponds with the WPA, WPA maps, it is reasonable to assume that this is uh, maybe something to do with the WPA work that went on at the fort during this period. Uh, the WPA came in and put uh, citizens to work building sidewalks, uh, putting in drainage ditches, uh, removing all of the old wooden porches from the buildings that uh, required a lot of uh, annual maintenance, painting, you know, replacing of wood. Uh, so next slide. We also found on some 1937 aerial maps, uh, there it is. 
uh, there is the building confirming the shape and the footprint uh, that we had seen in the WPA maps. Uh, you know, we did not see it uh, on maps before 1937. And by the time we get to the 1940 uh, aerial photos that came afterwards, uh, again, it's gone. So very short-lived little building, um, unique, uh, no solid evidence, but we we think that it might have had something to do with the WPA projects done at the fort at that time. Next slide. Uh, the only photographic evidence we found of that building outside of the aerial is we have a 1938 photo of the dead house. And on the right hand side, you can see two little stairways and just a little nubbin of the end of a building there. So it was not included in the quartermaster ledgers. So this again sort of indicates, you know, not an army building maintained by the quartermaster department. Uh, and out of everything that we have on file, no solid great photos of it, just that one little corner. Jeremy? All right. Yep. So that was the first example. Here's the second example. So now we're down behind the barracks. And they one of the things that had to be done for the uh, construction effort was to put in an infiltration basin um, for runoff of excess water and things, different kinds of drainage. The site has had a history of bad draining, drainage issues, and we saw lots of evidence of changes to the landscape and trying to divert water in various different ways. And of course, um, one of the things that the WPA did is put in a large ditch to actually try to get water to go in a certain direction. So um, we started to build this large inf infiltration basin. And at the one closer to uh, 102, we had started to remove this uh, area and we found lots of ash and clinker and artifacts that are all dating to a uh, 1904 to 1910 period, which is right before the fort's uh, dummy line or its uh, a train line was put in. So that was probably for that. But then in front of that, there's this short section uh, going east-west of uh, a lime, limestone blocks that are all mortared together. They're just one course. It's been laid on top of sand. And then here's the original ground surface before the military got there. Uh, this is far enough away that it's not associated with the archaeology they were talking about up here. And this is one of my monitors here, Andrew. Um, so uh, we didn't have any archaeology associated directly with this a uh, small section of wall. And uh, this was a, another big mystery for us that we didn't know anything about until we look at the historic record. So uh, this building did not appear on any maps uh, previous to 1892. We have 1888 to 1889 maps, does not appear there. Uh, 1892, uh, it does appear. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we see that at this point, uh, it is indicated as being used for band practice, uh, et cetera. Um, there is a little bit of a mention of a post trader. Uh, there had been a post trader at the lower post, uh, then activity ships to the upper post, uh, post trader set up shop. And at the same time, the government built a post exchange, uh, competed with his business. He basically negotiated with the army and said, hey, you know, I'm not making any money here. You guys have uh, got all this covered. So will you buy my buildings? And eventually the government did buy those buildings. Uh, and this leads us to believe that this was originally intended as a post trader. Uh, but then when the government bought it, they needed to put it to use for other things. Um, on the right hand side, uh, the color coded map from 1903 uh, it's brown, that building. So we know that that uh, indicates that it was a wood construction. Next slide. Uh, you know, here we have it again uh, behind uh, the, the barracks there. Uh, this is an 1895 map, uh, no indication of what it was being used for at that time, but uh, we can assume that it was probably still being used as the band practice area. Next slide. And here we have a what it was labeled as a circa 1900 photo of the 21st Infantry Band. Uh, the building in the background does not correspond photographically to any other buildings that are documented uh, in the later uh, quartermaster ledgers. So this is this is sort of an indication that this is the short-lived building that was used for band practice. The uh, 
21st Infantry was at Fort Snelling from June of 1902 to October of 1904. So it fits nicely uh, into that story. Next slide. All right. So, and I'm going to just back up a little bit and say that when we were doing the archaeology here, once we started talking more with Matt, you know, it's it's a back and forth relationship. When we analyze the artifacts that were from here, and Matt's telling us that this is part of a wooden building, the artifacts that are in front of it that date just after the building has been demolished and go up to 1910, there's also a mix of red and yellow brick inside of this area. And again, we know the building is a wooden building, so it doesn't have brick. And we also know that um, beginning in about 1903, we see a mix of red and yellow brick together that's being used on, on the fort. So as Matt and I have conversations that go back and forth about what we're seeing archaeologically and what he's finding historically, we can then make a much better picture and understanding of these overlapping and jumbled relationships for archaeology, which is really helpful. All right, finally, uh, we want to talk about the area uh, that we knew had had quite a bit of demolition in it, and that was for, uh, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the, uh, which had spurred the work at Lower Post, was the movement to have an intersection for Highway 5 and 55 put through. And this really gets underway in 1959 to 1960. And so we actually have a photograph of one of the buildings, uh, the theater building that, uh, that we mentioned before, being removed by a construction company prior to the highway being put in. Here in 1953 is an aerial that shows the upper post area and we just have a bri the bridge going across and a little bit of a road but then by 1970 look at the entire expansion here's the airport now here's highway 5 55 coming through it's all been bisected and here's a close-up image that shows that there used to be a whole series of buildings that were here that are now gone for the highway so uh, when we were doing our, our work in this area we knew that there these buildings had been demolished and we assume that there probably wasn't any effort, anything left from them because they had been torn down and the highway had come through and then sloped and slanted its area after the fact. But as we were putting in a new road for an emergency entrance area for uh, emergency vehicles and ambulances and fire, uh, fire trucks to be able to get through and circumnavigate the entire fort area, we found a large poured concrete building so that's a later building type, big, massive walls, big length of it squared off in the front going that way. But then an, interestingly, in front of that is a smaller, a limestone uh, mortar uh, outlay building it has the same orientation and it's on almost the same footprint. We don't have any archeology span besides these wall segments that we found and they both run off and are basically immediately cut off here by the slope for the highway system. So all that's left is these little slivers of these buildings with no other archeology, span no other artifacts. And uh, here's what Matt learned about those. Here's just another shot of the, of the, the in front one. So we, we kind of had an idea with the, with the concrete what one, what this was, but this was definitely a mystery to us. Uh, looking again back at the maps uh, and some letters that were found, uh, there was a row of homes uh, in that er that ended in that area, uh, wood frame homes referred to as clerk's row uh, or civilian employees in most of the buildings. But there was one building at the end that was unique. Uh, we found out that when they were building the upper post, they did not take account for there would be some officers that had very large families. Uh, six kids, a dozen kids, you know, enough kids that you couldn't fit them into the houses that were being built with three or four bedrooms. So, uh, you know, down on Officers Row, they had to build uh, an addition to one of the homes to accommodate uh, one guy and the hot, the post surgeon uh, also had an extremely large family that could not be contained in one of the other homes. So they built him a home with six bedrooms. Next slide. Uh, we see, uh, we found plans for this home. Uh, it was the only high quality wood frame home uh, that appears to have been built. It stands out from the sort of cheaper duplexes that stood right next to it. Uh, it was built well enough that uh, they proposed building two or three more of them for other officers with large homes, but those plans never came to fruition. 
Uh, the image on the right uh, is from a stereo view card that uh, was found at the office of the Minnesota archaeologist where they they do have some great records on Fort Snelling uh, but you can just see uh, that it's a very uh, well-made home and you know it's in great contrast to the the cheaper homes uh, to the next to the left of it next slide so that building disappears uh, around 1903, 1904. We can see where it was erased from a map uh, right next to the post exchange. Uh, some new artillery quarters, uh, officer's quarters start to go in uh, just to the right there. Uh, next slide. And then we see uh, in 1931, a new building pops up in that general footprint, and that is the Post Theater that we talked about earlier. Uh, you know, it was a big part of the Post. Uh, entertainment, you know, on a, the weekends was uh, largely spent at the Post Theater. So, Jeremy? Yeah, so that's uh, three examples of different places where archaeology definitely found something during monitoring. We stopped, we examined it, and but it was, without the efforts of Matt and our going back and forth, we really wouldn't truly understand these pieces. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point and uh, so that we can uh, maybe do some questions. <laughs> 